All right. So it is one o'clock, and we're going to go ahead and get started. So I'm going to switch us right back on over here so that we can get started with today's presentation. All right. So again, a good afternoon, everyone, and welcome, and thank you all for joining us for today's presentation, Juvenile uh, Prosecutor Training, Child and Adolescent Development. My name is William Moore, and I'm with OJJDP's National Training and Technical Assistance Center. And as your technical host, I would like to take a couple of minutes to discuss a few features of the Adobe Connect webinar platform and to provide a few announcements to keep in mind. Please note that today's presentation is brought to you by our friends at the National District Attorneys Association. Their information can be found here on this slide. Please note that today's webinar is being recorded and will be placed on our YouTube page. Here you can find past archived webinars. You can also contact the OJJDP TTA Help Desk if you would like to receive any supporting materials from any of our past webinars. For those wishing to download a copy of important documents and resources related to today's webinar, you may do so by locating the handouts pod directly above the chat area. Here you will find the webinar PowerPoint and an FAQ for webinar participants that will likely address any technical related questions that you may have. Simply click on the name of the file and then click the download button. At the end of today's presentation, there will be a Q&A session where the presenter will address some of the questions being posed during the presentation. Please type your questions into the chat box as they arise. Now we want to get a good accurate count of how many people that are joining us. Uh, we know during current times that some folks may be remote. However, if you're joining in a group, please take a minute to help us count. Please type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today, not including yourself. So if you have, say, um, another colleague next to you, you would put in plus one. If you have three or four other colleagues, you put in plus two, et cetera. Now, if you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. However, if you're viewing with multiple individuals or any additional folks, you can feel free to let us know um, how many additional people are in the room with you today. If you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type anything at this time. Please note that after today's presentation, we will have uh, ask you to take about five minutes to complete the online evaluation um, at the conclusion of this presentation. Also note that if you are joining in the group, or if you've indicated you've joined in the group, the person who is logged into the virtual room will receive an automated, automatic certificate of attendance. However, those in the group that would wish to receive a certificate, please note that you will have to download the group validation form for those additional people. We would just ask for you to download the form, fill out the information of those additional folks who would like to receive the certificate. Again, if you're signed in, you will automatically receive a certificate. That being said, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Ms. Susan Broderick, for today's presentation. Susan, take it away. Thank you, William. Um, Good afternoon and good morning to some of you in the West Coast. I have to say, it's just amazing to be looking at everybody signing in and from you're all over the country, all over the world actually, and this is really, um, it's a great opportunity. And um, so just by way of introduction, my name is Susan Broderick. I am a senior attorney with the National District Attorneys Association. and. Um, I, with my colleague uh, Christy Browning, are working on a um, training and technical assistance project, which um, is 
able to be supported through funding from OJJDP. And we are specifically um, looking at improving um, education and training opportunities for those of you on the front lines. I do have a background as a pro I was a prosecutor for 14 years in the Manhattan DA's office. I've been with NDAA and then I was over at Georgetown for a while. So um, it really is wonderful to be back at NDAA and working with all of you on the front lines. And to just explain to you how this um, webinar series came about, our original plan with our funding was that we were going to be doing our trainings through regional trainings. And those would probably be capped at about 60 people. And as everyone knows, uh, COVID came and my favorite thing is, you know, we make plans and God laughs. Well, we had to pivot with everything. And, you know, once again, there's a lot of silver linings um, in this crisis because today, I'm looking right now, we have 300, over 360 people who are watching this right now. And that's a lot more than we would have been able to do in person. So um, I'm really very excited that we're able to bring this to you today. Um, we will be doing a series, so just uh, keep in touch because we'll update, be updating you as to future webinars. But so today's webinar is um, Principles of Child and Adolescent Development. And it's a really critical area. We know that there has been a lot of research over the last 20 years. I'm sure most of you have been to trainings or been in the courtroom where you're hearing terms such as the ACEs study, trauma-informed, um, everything regarding the adolescent brain. And you know, while these strides in research have been a very positive thing, unfortunately, there have been some um, some advocates and some people out there who are kind of um, extending the research beyond what it says. So one of the um, main goals of today is to really bring you an update on the research, um, what the research says, and just as importantly, what the research doesn't say, because that's a really important component of all of this. And um, we're very lucky today to have um, a, a colleague of mine, is, is she's a also a friend, uh, Stacy Miller is an assistant district attorney. She um, is the team leader of the, ju the juvenile work over um, or down in Nashville, Tennessee. Stacy and I have been working together for a number of years. She is um, really just a, a very experienced prosecutor, but just a very wise person. And she knows um, child and adolescent development probably better than any other person I know, and I'm, I'm just so thrilled that she is here to present on child and adolescent development today. So, Stacey, um, I'll hand it over to you now. Okay. Thanks a lot, Susan. I appreciate that. Um, one thing I want to go ahead and say before I go over the learning objectives, um, one of the things um, that I, I think one of the reasons that I was chosen to do this presentation is I actually have a history as a speech and language pathologist. So my bachelor's degree is in speech communication. My master's of science is in speech communicative disorders or speech pathology. And I worked as a speech path for about 10 years and, you know, decided to go to law school and went to law school. And now I've been in this profession for almost 30 years. Um, so in reality, just like you guys, I'm a frontline prosecutor. But one of the um, advantages I have is um, having actually worked in the field of special education speech pathology. And so that's why this topic um, is one that I like to talk about, and I look forward to talking with you about it today. So today our learning objectives are to understand um, key childhood and adolescent development principles, to talk about the potential impact of adversity and toxic stress on the developing brain, and that's really important, um, understand the significance of the adolescent brain development, as it bears on future opportunities and vulnerabilities, and also to discuss resiliency and protective factors. And I know that that's a favorite topic of Susan, so she may jump in <laughs> at, this, at, at some point and talk about that, which we'll be happy yes. to have her do. Yes. Okay. Um, and as Susan said, we have had significant advancements really in the legal field in the acceptance of neuroscience. And as Susan said, one of the concerns is the science is real, but then the application to the law has been um, a, a little bit haphazard at times. Um, people are applying it maybe in a way, and by I say people, I typically mean defense attorneys, in a way that may not be totally accurate. 
and yet we as prosecutors have to apply it as well. And then we're going to get into that um, as we are asked more and more to have opinions and concerns about dispositional factors. You know, it's one thing to win our case, but it's the next thing at juvenile court to make sure that what we're doing is actually helping that youth um, get better and, and not commit a new offense. So we're going to look at both positive and negative experiences and, and on the environment of the child and the development and their life outcomes. Um, as we always talk about, it's certainly an interaction of nature and nurture, um, and we also know that early experiences have a huge um, impact on development. And so we're going to talk about that connection between brain development and behavior. So let's talk about early childhood brain development. So one of the things that, that we kind of have to learn, and this is kind of the science part of it, um, is that the brain develops um, basically from the bottom up and the inside out. And so essentially what that means is that the lower functions of the brain come in first, and then the higher functions, and we'll talk about the prefrontal cortex and the actual higher decision-making processes, those come in much later. And all of us who've worked in this field, we know that. And anyone who's been around a teenager, uh, you know, their favorite thing is when you ask, why did you do that, they typically answer, I don't know. And that may possibly be true. They really haven't thought through it. And so that's what we are dealing with every day. The other thing that the science has helped us understand is that toxic stress, and we're going to talk about different types of stress, but toxic stress actually disrupts brain growth. Okay, so as we were talking about, the brain develops in terms of lower functionings, you know, just regulating your heart rate, body temperature, that type of thing. And then we move up to the top level, which is basically like your, the brain's control tower. So it's, you know, controlling all of the different decisions that are made, taking in information, assessing that information. And as we know, that's the part that is very lacking in, in adolescence. And why is that important to us? Well, we need to keep a developmental perspective in terms of the youth that we are dealing with. And we also, in terms of the treatment and issues that we ask the court to address, they need to be concrete enough that that youth can actually benefit from that. So what about the effects of stress on the brain? Again, you know, these fancy science words, the neurobiology of stress, and we didn't learn about that in law school, but in order to advocate effectively and to make sure that our client, the community, um, our client, the state, our client, the city, depending on who you represent, and especially that victim, that they are well represented, we need to understand and, and the realities of stress. And so Dr. Stanley here in this next slide talks about what is the definition of stress. And by her definition, it's our internal response that our mind-body system creates when it experiencing something that we perceive as challenging or threatening. Now, we all know that. We all experience threat, stress. But we also know that each individual's stress tolerance is very different. You know, nowadays, dealing with the pandemic, uh, some people are handling it well. Many people are not handling it very well. It's extremely stressful. If you're like me, we are still going to court. Um, we're trying to be safe, yet we're trying to protect our community. We're having to wear masks in court, um, and it's, it's been stressful. And some of us are, are dealing with that better than others. There are some attorneys that I work with that, because of underlying medical conditions, they can't come to court, and that's very stressful. So I'm sure that you all are dealing with the same issues. Um, one of the important things that's at the bottom of this slide is, as Dr. Stanley says, it is possible to develop and build a tolerance for stress. So normally we talk about stress in negative terms, but we also need to um, accept, and I know that we all have, we've, we've been through law school and the bar exams, that um, actually we're wired, that stress response is part of our wiring, and that we sh can and should learn how to successfully respond to that. Um, the problem is with chronic or prolonged stress. And many times that is what the youth that we are working with, the youth that come to our court, are dealing with. So healthy stress can move you out of your comfort, comfort zone, help motivate you to change, perform, 
um, do better. If anyone's been involved in sports, you know, that, that little bit of being hyped up right before you get on the court or, um, you know, right before it's, it's your turn to perform in, in any kind of a play or something, you need that stress to, to get up for the occasion. But many of our youth are handling or dealing with uh, what we call toxic stress. So positive stress, you know, the brief increase in the heart rate, get a little stressful. Then you've got the tolerable stress. Um, maybe you're concerned about a trial that's coming up. Um, it's it's going to be a big issue. Maybe it's a transfer hearing, so you're really kind of getting stressed out about it. But that stress makes you get even more prepared and make sure that you've called all your witnesses and everybody's ready and you've got all your documents. But then that toxic stress is where the prolonged activation of the stress basically makes a person not function. And for our kids, it makes their brains not develop as well. Um, one of the things that can help that red light stress is if there is a supportive or protective relationship. And as we know, many of our kids, that's lacking as well. So stress on the brain, um, it's normal. We've talked about that. Um, and we can use it to motivate ourselves. Tolerable stress, again, that's, that, it's fine. It can be, it's time limited, and there are caring adults or people around the youth. They recover, and they do just fine. Our problem is going to be the toxic stress. And that's what our, the youth and many of the youth that we are working with, that's what they're dealing with. It's that prolonged activation, and it disrupts the brain development. So when we go back to those slides that talk about how the brain develops from low to high and from inside to outside, essentially this toxic stress can cause some of those synapses and neurons, the electrical impulses in the brain, to be disrupted and for that development not to occur as it should. Now, the next thing, the next slide, we have all talked about a lot, adverse childhood experiences. And this study, I just want to remind people, it was, um, the patients were recruited from 1995 to 1997. There were two principal researchers, Dr. Robert Anda and Dr. Vincent Felitti. Um, what they did for Kaiser Permanente Health was they looked at 17,000 patients and they looked at them over a life, lifespan. And they looked at their health and social issues as it related to adverse childhood experiences. Now, we're going to talk a, a little bit as this goes on. Um, an ACEs score is not a predictor of success or not success. And not everyone with a high ACE score, it means, you know, it's not going to do well. Um, many of us have experienced childhood issues, and we might have high ACE scores, but it certainly doesn't mean that they're not, we're not going to be successful adults. And that's where the resiliency comes in. And we need to focus on developing the resiliency, increasing a, a youth's ability to handle stress and to deal with trauma and toxic issues. And that's kind of where the dispositional part comes in for us. So one of the things we want to talk about in terms of trauma, not all stress is traumatic. It really depends on that individual person and the response to the situation. Um, when trauma results in dysregulation, basically such an upset, it manifests itself in physical, emotional, cognitive, and, and behavioral symptoms. And so where we find ourselves on the stress continuum is really um, the important thing. Um, I think one of the things we want to try to do with the seminar is some of these catchphrases. You know, you'll, you might be in a court hearing and um, a Department of Children's Services or Family Services person or a social worker or a clinician says, well, they have a high ACEs score. Okay, that, that's fine. That doesn't mean that they are not responsible for their actions. It also doesn't mean that they can't get better. Um, it may help us understand what they, not, what they need to work on, but we want to be sure that we don't just take a score and translate that into um, a, a basically the answer to the question. Um, the potential lasting effects of ACEs, um, what um, Dr. Anda and Dr. Felitti found were that um, many people had serious health problems. I've had the opportunity to um, hear Dr. Felitti speak, and 
it was really interesting. He actually played some of the videos where he interviewed patients who, uh, for example, were dealing with obesity or diabetes, depression, and uh, until they dealt with the underlying issues, they were not able, those individuals were not able to overcome those health issues. And that's really the point of ACEs, is that it's going to point out where the difficulties are that need to be dealt with so that people can move on and youth can move on beyond that. One of the things I want to talk about here is um, I, I know that Susan does a lot of work with the recovery court and recovery issues. And that's one of the things that I think has been a huge plus at juvenile courts across the country is taking on specialty courts, especially recovery court, um, mental health court. We have a mental health court here in Davidson County. And it's made a huge difference for that, those youth because they know that we're dealing with their specific issues. And we're acknowledging that until those issues are dealt with, they're most likely still going to have difficulty. Um, Susan, is there anything you want to say about um, recovery courts? Yes, okay. well, there's a lot. <laughs> no, no, I, I, um, I really appreciate you bringing them up because um, that has always been um, everything regarding ACEs and trauma um, for the last couple of years has really struck me as, well, you're only talking about one part of the equation. And, you know, adversity, I, I could probably guarantee that most of us um, who are participating today have experienced adversity in life. And unfortunately, what we were seeing a lot in the juvenile field was just so much focus on the negative um, without mm -hmm. any mm -hmm. conversation about the positive. And even if, with recovery course, what we're seeing now is a much more broader view of substance use issues, um, but recognize the importance of it's not just sending somebody to treatment. You know, it's not just, okay, you go to treatment, you're going to be all better, especially with young right. people. So it's all about connecting them to positive people, places, and things. And those are ways for people to thrive, because that really is what we're trying to do. We don't want just kids to be revived. We want them to thrive. So I think understanding ACEs is really important because I think one of the unfortunate effects of the ACEs study has been that, you know, it turned in trauma into a buzzword of sorts mm -hmm. and really understanding mm -hmm. that, you know, trauma is real. It's certainly real for a lot of the youth, but, you know, just, um, just because somebody has been through adversity don't assume they've been traumatized, um, but understand that if we are going to look at the underlying issues, that is important for them to thrive. So, and I'll talk more about resiliency later. But yeah, the recovery okay. courts are really starting to come, and we will be having um, a special session just devoted to substance use issues and use. Um, that'll probably be in September, and everybody will get more information about that as well. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So um, Thank really, you. Susan, Susan leads us right into our next slide, what to do about ACEs. And on that slide, um, you know, there's just so many different programs and services. Um, hugs nurses, parenting classes, um, domestic violence classes, social support, um, financial support, child care, mental health, alcohol and drug treatment. And I think that the big thing um, that we've all always known about is having safe, stable, and nurturing relationships. And that's one thing to say it, but a lot of times um, that is something that's lacking for our youth. And so mentoring is really important, um, getting them connected to services programs, faith programs that will provide that kind of adult supervision and support um, to help, help youth move on. So the ACEs study actually gives us the opportunity to talk about prevention. And as Dr. Anda said, what is predictable is preventable. And focusing on those protective factors um, is, is definitely going to help our youth. Again, um, the ACEs study contains that seed of hope, and we want to be sure that we, just as Susan was talking about, that risk factors um, are offset by protective factors and that we don't just focus on what the trauma or the problem is, but what we can do to intervene with that. And Stacy, can I just say a quick um, sure. word here? So, and, and one of the, um, when I first came into the juvenile justice field, um, and I, I would go to all of these conferences and everything was just so focused on the risk factors. And I can't even count how many times I went to a conference and they handed out the ACEs test. 
So, you know, and I, 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 and I came from, you know, a family I had. Both my parents were alcoholics. Um, we, we, there were troubles in my family. But I also had a grandmother who was not an alcoholic who told me I could do anything I set my mind on. And she not only balanced out the negative, she totally put the scales in that favor. And, you know, it was really frustrating for years going to these conferences and everything was just focused on trauma and the negative and stress and really very little attention being placed on the protective factors, which are really buffers. And, and I just know, I mean, I've seen the research about protective factors, but I've also had that real life experience where my grandmother was the game changer in my life. And I think what we're trying to do right now is to, again, raise awareness with all of you that when you're working with youth, it's not just about their ACE score. It's also looking at those positive childhood experiences because those are, they play just as an important part um, in helping to turn a kid back on the right trajectory. Absolutely. Excellent point. And I think one of the ways that it translates that I find um, in going to court every day is when I've got that, that youth on detention and, you know, maybe we're having a release hearing to see if there's someone, you know, we need that person to come to court. You know, is there an uncle who is supportive of that kid? Um, is there a step parent? Is there a football coach? Uh, the case I had this week, the football coach came and um, they are still having outdoor um, coaching and football practice, and that's great. So that's something that this kid can do. We need we need to keep him busy on positive things. And had that coach not came uh, to court, we I don't know that we would have had anyone um, who would be that supportive um, person to, to yep. basically help this kid kind of get out of the hole. That's amazing. Um, so that's what we're talking about, positive caring adults. And I think that's one thing that um, not only in the delinquency field, but certainly in the child welfare field as well, um, we have absolutely expanded, thank goodness, our view of, you know, who is a responsible caring adult. It doesn't have to be the parent. It can be, um, uh, it can be a, a, a older sibling. It can be someone from the faith community. It can be a soccer coach. It can be a football coach just looking for the people that can do that and prevent or reverse the damaging effects of the, of the toxic stress. The Harvard Grant study is our next one, and they talk about um, what goes right in childhood, and just what Susan was saying is actually more determinative than what goes wrong. And um, that's, that's the good thing that we can think about, that the good work that we do in helping repair these situations, it actually may have much more impact than, than the bad things that kids went through. So building that tolerance to stress, we, I'm sorry, um, building no, that tolerance. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, what Stacey, we can no, do. Just somebody asked, they just said about it being a strength um, focused approach and that's exactly what we're talking about. I'm okay, sorry to interrupt. Great. I'm no, no, that's, that's perfect. <laughs> no, no, that's perfect. <laughs> no, that's great. It is a strength focused approach. Um, and we're going to talk about that, too, a little bit as it, as it goes on. I, I think those of you who've been around a lot of time, like Susan and I have, you know, you remember when all the assessments were basically what's wrong with this family, what's wrong with this kid. And now, thank goodness, many of our assessments are about needs and strengths. Um, what does this kid or family need? What does the youth need? But also, what are their strengths? What can we build on? Um, and when we build on that, we build the tolerance, the stress, we build the resiliency, which is that ability to adapt and persevere um, and to go ahead and overcome any kind of a threat or challenge. Um, even Dr. Anda, this is an article where he had said that, you know, ACEs are not the be all and end all. And it's essentially what Susan was saying is that it's not just an, a number that is going to basically point to some negativity. But it certainly can help us understand what kind of trauma and, and issues we need to deal with. Um, and there is some research on the misapplication of the ACE score. We want to be sure to express that as well, um, because you may still be going to meetings or conferences where, you know, they hand out the ACE um, form. And thank goodness Susan's right. I mean, it seemed like for a while, every time we went to any kind of a meeting, there would be, you know, what is your ACEs score? Um, and now we know we've got to focus on much more than that. And as, as someone has said, the strength-based approach. And we call that basically just bringing back the balance. 
and what can we as prosecutors do to bring back that balance? And just as we said, we are going to build on strengths. <laughs> and I think what's interesting is that um, when when I first started this field in terms of child welfare law, and I started as a, um, a defense attorney, and that was back in 1991, and I represented parents, children, um, with guardian ad litem, um, kids attorney, parents attorney, and the focus was always on what did everyone do wrong. And it's been great to see that change to what can we, what can we build on? Um, what positive things are going on in this family? What positive things are going on with this youth? that we can actually build up as opposed to just focusing on what needs to be fixed. Um, and the therapists always get upset, and they're rightfully so, when we say we're going to fix. We don't fix anything. We provide the resources for the family or youth to actually you know, build their own strength and build their resiliency. Um, this is another article that we've got about positive childhood experiences. Um, and we just want to be sure that there's a lot of references for folks to see that you know, what we're saying is definitely going to build on that resilience. Now, we do have to talk a little bit about um, the adversity, but um, it, to me, that would be more on the um, adjudication part of it. We're talking about, did this, was this crime committed? Did this actually occur? And we never want to forget about the victim. We want to be sure that they understand because um, sometimes that can get lost, too. If we focus too much on what can we do for this youth, many victims feel, well, nobody talked about me. Nobody focused on, on my situation. So building resilience is, is really important, um, but we want to be sure that we cover the whole story as well. And also that each individual is very much different. Um, on this slide, we talk about how some people who have experienced serious issues, sexual abuse, um, you know, may not have serious psychological problems. So just basically what the crime was or what occurred um, or what that youth suffered from um, does not necessarily mean that um, they're not going to be resilient. Um, we are talking about um, understanding that children are both vulnerable and resilient. And so the goal on this, again, it, it may feel like we're being a little bit too involved in terms of a prosecutor in the resilience part of it. But if we do that, we will end up with better outcomes for that juvenile in terms of decreased recidivism and better outcomes for that victim and better outcomes for our public safety in our community. This is a really good slide um, in terms of the um, building blocks for increasing uh, resiliency. And I think we've talked about a lot of these, but um, it's a, I, just, I think it's a, a good um, presentation of the kinds of things that we can do to increase resiliency in kids. Yeah, it's something nice to hang up in your office. <laughs> it is, it's pretty too, you know, you need, you need yeah. pretty stuff. <laughs> Colorful. <laughs> and it's just really um, concrete it's, things that you can do. Yes, yes. In terms of family dynamics, um, we talked about that, and we, we one of the things that I, I mentioned, but I think more and more we are getting more involved in what is the family characteristic and how is it affecting the resilience. Is there a grandmother, as Susan talked about? Is there an extended faith community that can help build? Um, you know, maybe the youth used to go to some kind of a, a class or, or football camp, and then they don't get to go anymore. Did they used to have a mentor? Uh, what can we do to increase that to show how this child can actually succeed? Uh, one of the things that I mentioned quickly, um, but we're doing more, and when we did our juvenile justice reform here in, in Tennessee in 2016, we actually added a part to the statute where as a delinquency attorney, as a prosecutor, I can't change custody, but I can ask the judge to order a different placement. And we have found that to be very effective. So when you have the situation where you've got a mom and a stepdad and a sister and a grandmother, and the kid does really well at grandma's house or does really well at stepdad's house, during that term of probation, we've gone ahead and said he needs to live at the stepdad's house he needs to be where he's going to be supported, where he's with the adult who cares about him, 
and with the adult who's going to take him to intensive outpatient treatment or be engaged in the in-home services program um, or get him to school every day. Um, that's really important. And I, I see more and more that prosecutors are getting more involved on that back end part of it because if we do better on the disposition, we are less likely to have that youth coming back to our court. Okay, so quickly we're going to go back a little bit to the adolescent brain development just to kind of remind us. Um, so another thing we hear all the time is the brain continues to develop, you know, until the person's in their 20s. And I mentioned early on about the prefrontal cortex. So that's really the most important part because it's going to develop and govern our, the youth's reasoning and their advanced thought and impulse control. In the teens, it is still developing, and the brain research tells us that it is developing until the 20s. Um, that's really it's no excuse, but that's what we are dealing with. Um, in my studies as a speech pathologist, I had uh, neuroanatomy and neurology undergrad and graduate. And so when I got out, of, that was in 1982, I got my master's degree. That shows how old I am. Um, you know, this brain science, I mean, it, it, is, it's, it is what it is. It really hasn't changed any. It really wasn't until the Miller versus Alabama case that the legal community, especially um, at, at the juvenile court level, really uh, came into this. Um, so, and, and I'm not saying we didn't know about it, but as Susan said, it really became kind of a hot button issue. And I think what we're trying to do is bring it, um, as, as we have said, bring it back to normal, bring it back to reasonable. This is all true, but we're going to talk about it. It doesn't mean that that takes away responsibility. It just means the reality of the brains that we're working with are young people, and they might not be making the best decisions. They rely heavily Sophie, on. Like to, um, yes. Sure. No, I was just going to say um, when I first um, got involved in the juvenile work, it was right when um, they were putting out the studies that were coming out with the brain scans of adolescent brains. And I remember sitting at a conference, and um, they just had a list of reasons why, you know, the brain um, immaturity and why youth. Um, shouldn't go to adult court, and it was just all these factors on, you know, why youth are different. And, you know, the slides, like you said, merely confirm what we've known. We've known since 1899 that adolescents are different than adults. We've had a juvenile court. The first one was in 1899. We've known they were different. So what the science really does here is confirm what we've known since 1899. And I still remember sitting at this conference, and they were going over all the um, reasons that immaturity, you know, they were like, they get, engage in reckless behavior. They don't think of the consequences of their actions. They lie. And I looked at the <laughs> prosecutor sitting next to me, and I said, I just broke up with somebody for all of those reasons, and he wasn't an adolescent. <laughs> so immaturity is really a relative concept here. So, again, to try to keep this in perspective, because unfortunately I think right. some people have taken the adolescent brain studies, and they're trying to push them much further than what the research really says. Now, I totally agree, and I also think that that is actually a disservice to our youth and to our community and certainly Absolutely. to the victims. Because yep. the other side of that coin is that we have the great ability, our courts do and, and our community does, to, to prevent um, by increasing the resiliency and putting those services in place, we can prevent a future crime and we can prevent that youth from ending up on the adult system. Um, I always think back um, as a speech pathologist, when I had a 70-year-old who had a stroke and I had a 7-year-old who had a stroke, the 7-year-old with a stroke, I could probably get back to near 100% function because we've got a brain with the elasticity and plasticity and ability to develop the synapses and neurons and the electrical responses that they can overcome that, that injury, where a 70-year-old can't. Um, that brain is settled. That brain is its going to be really hard to come up with improved or different neural pathways. And we have the great ability to intervene with youth at the stage that, yeah, they're very frustrating um, because, as this slide says, they're running off their emotional centers, and um, but their brain is not fully developed, and we're able to intervene with that. And so I think it can be a big plus, but it means we've really got to put those services and intervention in. 
Absolutely. And I um, think that that's where, I mean, for me, the biggest takeaway from the adolescent brain development is that kids aren't hardwired yet for bad behavior. Mm -hmm. And we do have an opportunity mm -hmm. to um, help to build resiliency with them. Yes, very well said. Absolutely. Um, and that's it, the hardwiring. Um, the pathways in their brains can still be developed, and that's unfortunate with, with many of my older patients. It was really hard to develop a new pathway because the, pretty much the wiring was there, and we would have to come up with alternate circuitry as opposed to being able to develop new circuitry, which, which the youth can. Um, yeah. The other, this slide also talks about the other thing that we all know is that teens naturally and chemically are seeking that risk. Um, some of the interesting studies talk about, uh, you know, it's certainly possible that youth start off at a high level, let's say, you know, at 15 with an aggravated robbery because the risk, the risk is attractive to them. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will continue in that, but they absolutely are attracted to risky behaviors. And as we talked about, um, the neuroplasticity is what we are able to build on and develop. Um, we have, I think, talked about all these things in terms of the interplay between the brain um, and the interaction with the parents and the experiences that the kids develop. Now, one of the things that we've done here, in addition to a recovery court, is we also have a gang court. We call it the GRIP court. And we try to get kids to be out of their regular environment and move them into more social environments, working with church groups, working with the community. Um, in order to get them out of a gang situation and understanding that to be part of the, the larger community and how to contribute to the larger community. So part of that is, you know, changing their playmates and changing their playgrounds. Let's show these kids that there's a bigger world out there that they can be part of and that we as a system are supportive of the youth and believe that they can be successful. Um, the implications of immaturity, uh, again, the prefrontal cortex, um, we've uh, covered this, the impulse control, um, having um, risky behavior, um, that the risk and rewards basically gets a, a little bit off kilter with this group. Um, and also emotionally, they're going to have higher highs and lower lows. Um, if you've ever represented these kids, you know that, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to know, you know, how they take things. Sometimes very serious things is, doesn't upset them, but you know, somebody said something mean to them on Instagram, and they're all upset about that. Um, I think it's also harder for our kids because of all of the social media. Uh, it's, it's difficult for them, you know, not to be affected by the peer group that they choose and to be able to remove themselves from that. And sometimes that's what they need in order for us to kind of rewire them. Um, and as Lawrence Steinberg says, this is our age of opportunity where we can actually do that. Now, we do want to emphasize that the brain research does not mean that they don't know right from wrong. Um, adolescents, and it doesn't mean that they're the same as children, and it doesn't mean that they're not responsible. And of course, we know that all juvenile offenders are not the same. Um, I'm fortunate here to have a really great group of public defenders, and you guys probably are too. Um, so I don't, I don't get as much of this well, they're just a kid. I do get that from attorneys who typically do not practice at juvenile court, and they'll come in and that's their defense. Um, oh, he's just a kid. It's really okay that he had a gun. And I swear that that actually happened on a detention hearing. And between the judge and I, that attorney, of course, got blasted because a kid with a gun means all kinds of bad things can happen. Um, from that child being hurt to the family being hurt to a community member, a victim, um, and so he's just a kid with a gun is not really a good defense. But basically what he's saying is, well, it's just a kid. Well, this is our time to intervene. We can't let that happen. Another important thing is individual assessments. I think that we've all learned that um, these, the blanket kind of, you know, a survey type thing is not going to be much help. We need to know that um, what is going on in terms of needs and strengths from this individual youth. One of the documents or, or tests that we use is called the CANS, and you all probably use it too, the Child and Adolescent Needs and Strengths. Um, and we also um, like to get a risk assessment. 
to identify what is the specific risk for this youth. So for all of our youth in detention, we do a specific risk assessment. So it may be an offense that on the surface may not seem that bad, but if they have very serious um, risk factors, we certainly want to get some intervention before we release them back to the community. And so those assessments help us actually handle that situation better and get that kid help sooner. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Supreme Court rulings. We always like to go ahead and mention them. Um, of course, I, I've already talked about Miller versus Alabama, and that, and that was a big, um, a, a big kind of a sea change in terms of the Supreme Court actually talking about the brain science. And so many attorneys then thought, well, you know, we really do need to pay attention to this. But as Susan said, in 1899 in Cook County, Illinois, we had the first um, juvenile court. So it's not like we haven't thought about this and, and believed that children were different for a very long time. Um, and then I, I know some of you are still um, dealing with the Montgomery versus Louisiana issue in terms of if there was a mandatory LWOP without a hearing, then essentially you've got to go back and look at those cases. So for us, uh, we really need to keep the brain science in perspective, but we also need to be very well versed. Um, I think one of the frustrating things when these issues first came up is a lot of lawyers, as prosecutors, were saying, you know, do I really need to deal with this? Um, why am I having to, I'm not a social worker, why am I having to deal with brain science and behaviors and resiliency? But understanding it better will make us much more effective. So how do we see this? How does this translate then into the courtroom? Well, obviously directly when we have expert witnesses. And one of the things that um, we do is we, we both, um, meaning defense and prosecution, uh, the state of Tennessee has a contract with, in Nashville, the Vanderbilt um, Forensic Psychology Department. And so we use the same expert. In certain situations, though, where we disagree with that expert, we do go ahead and hire our own expert. So um, it's expensive, but in serious cases, on transfer cases, um, quite often we will go ahead and expend those resources. They don't necessarily come through with a totally different response, but they may come through with some other issues that we're able to bring up. So one of the things is even though the person's an expert, we don't absolutely have to accept 100% what their evaluation is. And then indirectly, of course, through the advocacy, CLE, media books, articles. And as Susan said, in many of our trainings, whether it's a judge's training or an attorney's training, um, these issues have been brought up. It's, um, it's been a very popular topic. Now, um, when we talk about this, we want to emphasize that the juvenile's deficiencies do not invariably mean that they fall below the legal threshold. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, different difficulties or different diagnoses that juveniles, are, juveniles have. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they are not competent. And that was um, cited in the uh, law review from Notre Dame in terms of the brain science after Graham v. Florida. And that's really an excellent um, article. I, I hope that you all take a, a chance to go ahead and read that one. And again, um, just kind of saying that brain development is not the end all and be all, again, in that same article. Now, um, because we may have a person who is 14 at the time that the expert evaluates them, um, there's really no way to know exactly how that individual child is going to develop and how their brain is going to mature. But we do know that they will develop and mature. One of the things that I think is really important is if you get an evaluation, most evaluators will also will do another evaluation, usually in a year. So it is certainly possible to have a 14-year-old who qualifies as incompetent or has certain deficits, but with education and development, just the brain development, they may end up not being incompetent at 15. One of the things that I always do is I don't dismiss the cases. I just go ahead and, and we call them retiring them. They basically, I hold them over their head. I don't want those cases to go away. 
so um, as as we know as prosecutors, our job is to always seek justice. We've got to balance safety, accountability, and development, and we want to be sure that we are always um, taking a, a very um, clear look. Um, we want to expose expose any flaws or biases or limitations in the science and assessment tools. One of the things that it's important to do is make sure that that evaluator is qualified to do what they say they're doing. I'm sure that you all have had situations where uh, maybe it was someone who was a licensed clinical social worker. Well, in our state and probably in your state, they are not a psychological examiner. And so looking at your state licensure laws, what are these people actually qualified to do? Are they going beyond um, what their license allows them to do? Also as prosecutors, to refocus our discussion not only on the law, but also on the victim and the community. So what is the law? What, how has this impacted our community? Um, especially um, in the dispositional portion, I like to be sure that our judges understand what was the impact, the greater impact, not just one victim, um, but how did this affect our community and how did this affect that victim's feeling of safety and security in our community? So we're asking the court to perform its gatekeeping function. I would assume that your statutes are similar to ours in that no matter what the evaluation says, it is our judge or magistrate who's actually going to make that determination of competency um, or limitations that the youth may have. And again, um, can't focus enough on the victim and community. Uh, it's really, really important. And especially because our youth are going to be coming back to that community. They're, they, even if they go into state custody, even if they're transferred um, and end up with a jail sentence, no one stays out of the community forever and they will be coming back. And we want to be sure uh, that the victim and the community know that we've done what we need to do, that when they come back, they come back better. Now the defense is going to have different goals, of course. Um, they could be raising absolutely legitimate concerns about their clients. Um, I had a, a kid yesterday on my, on my settlement docket, and he was charged with aggravated assault. He's an adopted um, youth. He's 15. Um, he was, uh, came from uh, another country. He probably has reactive attachment disorder. But when he strangled his mother, that's not going to be an excuse. And um, he did not kill her, thank God. Um, but he did. Uh, it was a serious assault. And so when the defense attorney comes at me with that, honestly, I said, I don't care. It means we need different services, but it doesn't mean that he can go home with nothing. And so basically, with intensive in-home services, reengaging in counseling, getting an assessment for medication, he can continue with his reactive attachment disorder counseling. But, um, and the judge also imposed that he can't be alone with the mom until the therapist says that that's going to be okay. And I understand that these parents really want to take care of him and want to keep him, but until his behavior changes, it's going to be very dangerous. And so many times we've got to intervene when a defense attorney is simply saying, well, you know, I mean, he's got this issue. Well, that's great. We need to deal with that issue. We just can't say that that's an excuse, but that is going to be used sometimes. I'm sure you all um, have, have had that situation. Um, Again, um, we, we want to talk about treatment, but it can't overcome that accountability. That's, I think, really the point of, of my little scenario that I talked about yesterday. Um, but I'm sure I seemed very harsh to that family. I understand and I'm sympathetic to his issues, but he needs intervention. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, suppressing evidence um, and um, suppressing statements when we talk about Miranda. And that's another um, thing that can come up in terms of uh, the brain science. All right, so how would you best prepare for these court issues coming up? Um, of course, you know, literature review. Um, we've got some really good resources that, that, that Susan and Christy have put in this PowerPoint, so that's really great to take a look at those. Um, I think familiarize yourself with the tests and the measures that the people use. Um, I, I don't expect any of us to become experts on um, any of the psychological evaluations, 
but um, if you get to know your expert, they'll be happy to talk with you about the test and what the test really does and what the test really doesn't do. Um, one of the things um, that is not going to be um, fleshed out or tested is malingering or faking unless you ask that expert to do that. And so we have specifically on many of our, our situations asked, are they faking good or faking bad? And we want them to make a professional statement about that. Um, because many of the times you'll have the evaluation come through and your victim or your police officers will say, well, he seemed fine you know, when all this was occurring and now all of a sudden he has all these issues. So let's go ahead and ask that expert to, to find that out. Um, and of course, uh, we've got Daubert and Fry and our rules of evidence, and I think we're all familiar with, with that in terms of preparing for court. And um, how it can come up with court, well, it certainly can come up on our charging decisions, competency to stand trial, waiving Miranda, we're going to talk about that, um, using a defense of mental disease or defect, and then whether we divert a case or um, I think the biggest part that where we can really help is on the dispositional portion. Now, in terms of charging decisions, <clears throat> if, a, if a, a crime or offense occurs, I'm going to go ahead and bring that charge, and I'm sure that you guys are too as prosecutors. The reality is I, I'm not going to not bring a case because of an issue. Um, because if I get that case to court, then I can get that youth under court supervision. I can use the court's power to make sure that the youth gets the alcohol and drug treatment um, or um, resides in a, a safer place or with a more caring individual, um, has anger management class, has mental health counseling. Without that charge going forward, I really don't have any power to do anything. So I'm really careful, especially certainly on um, with older teenagers, we re I really don't want to not charge. I want to go ahead and charge and then take all these issues into account in terms of disposition. Um, sometimes I have victims that call up and say, you know, I really don't want, I just want him to get help. And so I always still feel the best way I can make that youth get help is to have them under court supervision. So I definitely feel more comfortable with formal charges. And Stacey, I um, yep. would just say there, though, too, that we have seen, I guess, over the last five to ten years, uh, many more diversion programs. Um, mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. did talk about this in the last webinar that, you know, diversion is certainly um, an option, but diversion is, and this is according to the NDAA standards, diversion is also a charging decision. And yes. Very often, like you're saying, um, to offer the opportunities of diversion with certain conditions um, and then not dismissing the case until those conditions are met. So you may not formally have to bring the case in front of the judge, but at least if it's um, a case that is suitable or a, a youth is eligible for your diversion program, it is good to um, have those conditions spelled out. And we actually have a whole presentation on diversion. So, um, but I think in some jurisdictions, diversion is starting before the prosecutors get involved. And I think that's troublesome um, very often because what I've heard in those jurisdictions is there is no leverage and there is no motivation for the youth to participate. So um, I do think diversion can still be um, a charging decision, but it can be a way for those lesser cases to be handled um, in a less formal manner. Yeah, I agree with you completely, and I, th I think that you have outlined it much better um, in terms of um, kind of the nuance of that. I, th I think my emphasis, I agree with you, is whether it's a, it, whether there's a petition or not, whether there's actually something going right. forward to the court. And I, I agree. We, we use a lot of mediation, restorative justice. We, we use a huge amount of mediation, um, victor, uh, victim offender reconciliation. I think any kind of alternate dispute resolution is fantastic, but we have a hard time if we don't actually have that, we call it a petition or that charge before the court. But I totally agree right. with holding it in abeyance um, and basically giving that youth time to get involved in those services. And it also helps the victim. Right. Um, we have had victims that have been 
very pleased with restorative justice and, and highly pleased with mediation processes, especially when we've had domestic violence within a family. We have found that mediation is, is a huge help. Many of our families just haven't been that comfortable with talking things out, working things out, and so they would call the police all the time. And it helps them to develop those skills to deal with some family issues on their own without having the system um, be involved. Um, but when you have a couple of assault charges and you know it keeps coming back like that, thank goodness no one's being seriously injured, but how can we develop the skills within that family so that they can control their situation much better? So I agree with you completely. Um, and, and I think it's, it's really great to have the prosecutor involved in that. Um, Susan's right, sometimes when there are just simply cases that just get diverted, we still as prosecutors for our, in representing our community, they're going to wonder what happened with that charge. And so I think that we need to totally be involved and knowledgeable about how cases are being handled in our court system. Um, and I think this next slide about the formal charge, we've, we've talked about that. Um, now, on, the a competency evaluation is done, uh, they will look at all these different issues, and I'm sure you all have seen plenty of these. Sometimes my favorite part to read is that capacity to understand the adversarial nature of the proceedings, and I always love how they say, what is the role of the prosecutor? Um, that's always interesting. They typically get that part right, um, but many times um, you're, you read and, and the youth really doesn't understand, uh, or they say they don't, and that's, again, why I like to make sure that our um, evaluators are making an assessment as to whether the youth is faking good or faking bad. Um, it's really important that the, with all the brain science, but we understand that the maturation process of the brain, that normal development and maturation, the elasticity and plasticity, is not a defect or a mental illness. That is normal development. And so that's not a, a reason that the youth you know, can't get better. Um, it's essentially why, re why the youth can actually change their behavior. Um, we also talk about, we've talked about having regular evaluation. So if you have a youth that has cognitive impairment or has some type of um, deficit that the expert is saying they are not competent at this time, we always get them evaluated um, again. And uh, typically our experts will go ahead and evaluate once a year. Um, one of the things that I like to ask, sorry, one of the things that I like to ask in terms of limiting or challenging um, the, the expert, we want to ask about um, their ability to basically how would they function better. And one of the questions I always like to ask is will they function better in a structured environment? And that typically is not um, it's not perceived by the defense or even by the youth or, or the judge as a negative. Um, I'm not saying I, I, I need for them to be locked up, but what I'm saying is what kind of structure will make them function better? And it could be structure of a single caring adult. It could be structure of a, um, an acute psychiatric facility. We need to, for them to explain to us if this youth is not functioning well, what kind of environment will make them or help them comply with our community norms and standards. And so, uh, you know, part of what our experts can do for us is give us a good idea of what kind of treatment is, is necessary. Now, it's really important um, to prepare your examiner to talk with them. And I think it's most important to go ahead and submit documents. The previous prosecutor, I've been here a little over eight years now in this role, and the previous prosecutor never really sent much of their file. They just basically sent the court file, and, and I don't send any kind of attorney privileged information. But I may have um, their previous charges. I certainly have their juvenile history. I may have child and family team meeting notes. Um, I may have some other uh, former um, earlier psychological. I'm going to send all of that to the evaluator um, so that they see the whole picture. We don't want just the defense to go ahead and send in their information. I always ask them, you know, what about recidivism? Is there any way that they can make an assessment in terms of that? 
um, for the juvenile's characteristics, um, these are the things that they're going to be looking at. And um, one of the things that I think is important, the prior experience with interviews, kids do learn and their brains develop. And your police officers will tell you that, you know, they have been called out for calls for service to this home so many times and they've dealt with this kid so many times. And the kids get wise to the system. And so they will develop and they will learn. And that's why reevaluations are really important. As our next slide says, um, you know, you want to you want to go ahead and, and pick your battles. Um, we we want to be sure that we're not just attacking an expert to the attack the expert. Figure out what from that expert you can use um, to support your situation or your position in the case. And we want to be sure that we're familiar with that expert. And like I said, we have submitted our information to them. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the different diagnoses that you may see on the evaluations. And a diagnosis um, in, the, in the report doesn't mean that they're not competent. These sections are basically just to say this is how a youth with, say, an intellectual disability may appear on the evaluation. So one of the things is, they are probably going to be very hard to test um, because of the intellectual disability. Um, they may not understand many of the concepts, and they may have impaired reasoning. So we wouldn't be surprised to see that if we see a low IQ or intellectual disability. Now, kids with ADHD, um, their responses are also going to be um, different in terms of they're definitely going to be hard to test because they're going to be impulsive. They're not going to be able to hold their attention very long. And many of these tests require the youth to really pay attention. Um, and so that might be a reason in terms of the evaluation that you, you, you could honestly ask, did you actually get a good evaluation? And they may not have been able to evaluate them um, fairly or effectively because of the ADHD. Um, in terms of learning disabilities, um, Again, it depends on the type of learning disability, but quite often um, they will have difficulty answering questions following the instructions. And they also don't really, they may not learn from experience because kids with different learning disabilities learn differently. And they may be um, in a situation where uh, they need a special type of training, uh, treatment, or a resource in terms of, of uh, a treatment, residential treatment, or in-home treatment. Um, youth with mood disorders, certainly um, they're probably going to be very unmotivated to perform. And sometimes um, I've had evaluations come back where they can't even be tested um, simply because, you know, they're just not, they're not going to cooperate. They're just not going to cooperate. Um, anxiety disorders, uh, we've had a couple of kids that have had serious anxiety disorders. And they, again, um, they're, very unlikely to engage because of that. The children with the thought disorders or youth with thought disorders, uh, very interesting in terms of um, finding treatment. Uh, there aren't as many youth that have serious thought disorders. We've had a couple of kids recently um, who were charged with homicide uh, who did. And um, thank goodness our Tennessee Department of Children's Services actually came up with a residential treatment program specifically designed for kids with lower IQ um, and uh, with thought disorders. And so they're in a specialized program in another part of the state. Um, they were deemed to be incompetent. And we will have them reevaluated once they're done with that treatment program. I'm not sure whether they'll be competent the next time. But by holding those charges, we're able to keep them we using the gatekeeper function of the judge being able to keep that supervision and basically make them um, be involved in these services and their families. Um, I want to, we want to talk a little bit about competency to waive Miranda. Um, this this will Stacey, come up. Can I just interrupt for one second? Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, I just wanted to respond because um, we, we have a question asking um, if your state added. Um, has added the not competent due to immaturity or intellectual disability. And it's one of the things, I probably should have said this at the beginning, you know, we're providing really a national overview. Um, and mm -hmm. one of the challenges with working um, with the juvenile justice system is that every state has its own juvenile code. So 
So, you know, of right. course, everything we're giving you today also has to, you know, you have to look at your state laws. So, you know, we can't address every single state's um, specific legislation. So also just keep that in mind. But these are general principles that we're sharing with you. And of course, your, the, the state statutes will actually control in these situations. Just wanted to add that. Okay, okay, yeah, and I do want to address that a little bit. I, that's an excellent question. And one of the things that we did when we uh, rewrote um, our juvenile rules of procedure, we did that in 2016 and changed it to juvenile rules of practice and procedure, we added um, a Tennessee Rule 207. And essentially, um, to specifically answer your question, different experts across our, our state, the ones here in Nashville will say under the age of 12, they believe that they are going to be incompetent due to immaturity. Um, they have not set any specific standard in terms of intellectual disability. Um, other parts of the state, they don't deem that to be incompetent under the age of 12. So it's more of what their practice is in terms of that. Um, so for those youth that have been deemed incompetent, but they have engaged in violent or risky or dangerous behavior, under Rule 207, we put them on the special mental, mental health docket, and we review those cases um, once or twice a month, and we make sure that our Department of Children's Services is providing the services and that they are complying with the services, and we um, supervise, basically, it's, it's kind of like a review docket. And um, so under that rule, the judge has authority to continue to monitor their behavior um, and their services until age 19. Um, age of majority is 18 in our state, but for delinquency purposes, supervision can go on till 19. So that's kind of one way that we have addressed that issue. So I hope that kind of answers your question. Thanks. Uh, on the competency to waive Miranda, so one of, one of the cases that's really important on that is JDB versus North Carolina, and that is 564 US 261. 2011 case, 2011 case, and this is what JB talks about is that um, juveniles' um, intellectual development has to be addressed, but it does not make them incompetent to waive Miranda. It just basically, I think most of our officers and detectives are really good at um, talking to the youth at their level, and so looking at those um, kind of the totality of circumstances, did you take into account that this is a 14-year-old versus a 17-year-old, that type of thing? Um, and um, as, as we've said, that it's not really an inquiry as to whether it was smart for the juvenile to waive or not. I mean, typically, in my cases, they, they just go ahead and blurt out, you know, well, that, that was their gun, that wasn't their gun, they didn't know the car was stolen, you know. They didn't mean to fire the weapon. They say all kinds of things, and I'm sure in your cases they do too. Um, and our, our office is great about, you know, going ahead and giving them Miranda warnings, and then the kids quite often talk. So that's kind of just the way kids are. And it's probably not the smartest thing to do, but they were given Miranda, and that's legitimate. Um, in terms of the brain immaturity, so, uh, you know, we might be concerned that maybe they didn't really understand was it taken in front of their peers, that type of thing. But the reality is if they were given Miranda and they made statements, we're certainly going to use those statements. The defense attorney is, of course, going to question the whole process, and that, that's fine. And that's what the JDB case talks about. Um, how long were they interrogated? Were they interrogated before or after the charges? Um, what were the methods used? And, you know, our police officers and detectives do a great job. They typically don't um, keep them for very long, and typically they don't have to. Usually the kids just kind of say what happened. Um, in our state, a parent does not have to be there for um, a youth to be questioned, and they will go ahead and, and bring them in. They typically notify the parent that the youth is at such and such precinct, and then the detectives go ahead and do their questioning. Um, so you may end up in a, a contested hearing in terms of a motion to suppress. And, um, you know, it, it's helpful to have the officer, if they have um, gone ahead and recorded it, um, we talk about that, taping it. And also, you know, nowadays many officers have body cams. So um, if it's a traffic stop and the smell of marijuana, they get the youth out of the car, they go ahead and do a consent search, 
and all of that, if, if that's going to be on a body cam, that would be great. They sit them down, give them the Miranda, and that's when they all start saying, it wasn't my gun, it was Bubba's gun, and that's, you know, then we're off to the races from there. Um, so one of the things that when you're talking to your officers, you want to be sure that um, they go ahead and kind of use facts to demonstrate that the kid knew what they were talking about. So um, let me go back. Sorry. Um, so we want to be sure that they say things like, you know, did you understand what I said to you? And the most important thing is have that officer ask the youth to report to repeat it back to them. Um, that has been great when we've had that on, on I've get, read these rights to you, understand as I've read them to you, what do you think I'm saying, and let the kids say it back. We do that in court all the time, too. When the youth is taking a guilty plea, and I'm sure you guys do, too, you know, do you understand what that means that you are going to go to the Department of Children's Services custody? Do you understand that means that you have got to participate in intensive outpatient alcohol and drug treatment? Um, and go ahead and, and make them say it back. From a communication standpoint, that's one of the best ways to actually make sure that they have taken in the information and are able to express it back out to you. Um, again, when we're talking about the deficits, they don't apply in every case. Um, every kid is different. And as Susan was saying, the brain science talks to juveniles in general, and our presentation is about the law in general. Um, but we want to be sure that each individual case is taken separately. So what about challenges? Um, you know, we want the truth to come out. Um, we want to be sure that um, everything is done above board because our, our goal is justice, is doing it the right way. And I think the main point is that we want to be sure that the juvenile is held responsible and that they get the right services. If that juvenile is not held responsible, at juvenile court, where our goal is going to be rehabilitation and treatment, and they're able to kind of game the system, that's not really any benefit to them or to the community. This is their best chance to get the treatment that they need um, and to get the resources that they need to not commit a new offense. Um, we talked a little bit about challenging um, the evaluation and um, Again, just want to remind folks that I think having them, your expert, go ahead and make recommendations for treatment. Um, they may even recommend residential treatment, and that's really, really important to get that on the record. We may have a defense attorney saying that, well, because of the evaluation, they're not really competent and they shouldn't have to do anything. No, the expert may say they actually need to do these specific things. Um, uh, I think probably everybody is familiar with the uh, Dobert standard or, or Daubert, however you say it, in your part of the country. Um, and we do want to be sure that the evaluator um, used the correct methodology, the correct version of the test. I've seen sometimes that there's actually a more recent version of a test. And also, what is the degree of error of the test? That's really important. So those are the kinds of things that in preparing you can get an idea by pre-interviewing your expert, you know, what, what are the strengths and weaknesses of each specific test instrument that they're using. In terms of um, the things to look for, uh, you want to make sure that your expert um, meets the tools of the evaluator tools and standards of your community. Each person is different. Like I said, even in Tennessee, our experts here in Nashville probably make some different decisions than those in Knoxville. And we've used that to our advantage in some cases where we've actually then hired the expert out of Knoxville um, if we're trying to get um, a different view of the situation. So what about the limitations of the science? And we'll talk about that and what the researchers say. And this is what Susan was specifically addressing, that you know the neural image, even though it's an image, it's a brain scan. And it doesn't necessarily, it's not the be-all and end-all. And it's certainly not going to tell us what the risk of recidivism is or what, a, what the propensity is for violent behavior. It's, it's a brain scan. Um, it's, it's, it's not the answer to our questions. Um, I think one of the most important things is that 
you, you can't, the neuroimaging is not going to help us anticipate behavior in the real world. That's going to be based upon past behavior. So one of the things that we talk about is, um, and Susan addressed this earlier, the unintended consequence of the misapplied science. And it's been talked about all across the country. What about raising the age? You know, maybe we just need to have juvenile court handle all the way up to age 24, 25. Um, that's what the brain science says. But the reality is um, when our state has looked at that, you're going to need all different types of treatment resources. And is it not accurate that currently, on the adult side, they're looking at all the things that we've looked at at juvenile court. They are now looking at, in terms of juvenile justice reform, more programs, uh, mental health courts. Uh, we even have a, a veterans court, um, recovery courts, family law courts, you know, all kinds of specialty courts. And there's no reason why the adult system cannot adapt. That the reality is the brain can still develop and we can absolutely intervene. But does that mean that it, all those cases need to be heard at juvenile court? One of the other unintended consequences is we almost all use age of 18, or I think um, in Georgia, I think it may be 17. Y'all correct me if I'm wrong. But some of the states actually have lower ages. But your state already has an age that creates the age of maturity or majority for all of this. So basically what we're saying, and I, I love this. Go ahead, Susan, you want to say something? I do. I just wanted to respond. There had been a question about okay. um, the Grisso scales. And so Thomas Grisso, um, he's now retired, but he has been very involved in the juvenile justice reform and had come up with um, some scales measuring um, comprehension of Miranda warnings. And I will make sure, I, I'll make that um, link available of his scales to the group. So it's, I, I don't want to interrupt. The, I know we're running out of time, but I just wanted to answer that question. OK, OK. Yeah, uh, Dr. Gr Dr. Grisso well. is definitely the expert on that. And um, yeah, I think that those scales would be really helpful. But um, as Susan has said, it's really kind of interesting that everything old is new again. Um, that basically, uh, you know, what, what our job is, is to prove the case and then deal with these issues in terms of disposition and to decrease recidivism and protect our community. And it, the behavior in adolescence for our youth, it's, it's so many different um, interactions and, and influences of experience, parenting, um, socioeconomic status, opportunities for um, schooling, psychological well-being, mental health issues, alcohol and drug issues. It's a lot that the juvenile court is really expected to deal with, and we as prosecutors are expected to take into account. Um, in the Kent case, um, the Supreme Court talked about um, certain factors before a juvenile can be, can be transferred to criminal court. And of course, they said there has to be hearing. And I'm sure that all of us do um, quite a few transfer cases. And these are some of the, the factors that a case has to have prosecutorial merit, um, certainly has to be a serious crime. Or if it's a less serious crime, it's a part of a repetitive pattern. We've all had those where, um, you know, I've, I've had groups of kids where, I mean, they, they went on a, a, a crazy, you know, two or three day stint where they did a bunch of aggravated robberies and, you know, they're going to get transferred. So it's the repetitive pattern. Maybe they didn't have much of a history, but public safety required that we go ahead um, and put them on a transfer list. And that's not any different. This Kent case is from 1966. Um, again, uh, as, as we say, does all of this sound familiar? So um, in one way, Applying the brain science is new in terms of we have got to be cognizant of these factors. But in another way, as a profession, we have been dealing with this and will continue to deal with this. I do like on the Kent factors we're talking about the um, home, environmental situation, emotional attitude, pattern of living. And, and those things in terms of the disposition, um, we really need to look at that home situation. And that's where I think our role of the prosecutor has really increased. Um, I came to this job 
my past, my job before that, I was 10 years in private practice, and then I was about 10 years as the um, general counsel for our Tennessee Department of Children's Services. So we, we brought all the civil child abuse cases at juvenile court, and now I've been here for eight years. Um, and at first, being a neglect dependency child welfare attorney was a bit of a change to becoming a prosecutor, and some of you may have been full-time prosecutors all your career. But actually, in terms of the dispositional part between that and the background of speech pathology, having the ability and, and not feeling uncomfortable with the role of looking at services programs, um, evidence-based programming, that's really something that we're seeing an increased role in the prosecutor where it's falling on us for the judge to say, okay, so what do you want to do about this? You know, he's, been, he's guilty of these offenses. Now what are we going to do? And having a really full-blown dispositional hearing. Um, we've talked about this, but one of the ways that we address that is certainly through specialty courts, recovery court, gang court, sex offender court, mental health court, where we're sure that the disposition is matching what the issues are for that youth. So one of the things that we want to say in conclusion um, is that juvenile court, uh, neuroimaging is something that we've known forever. Um, but the court's got to consider all of the situations um, that a juvenile, their environment, their physical, emotional characteristics, and that it's not just a science issue. We have got to intervene to protect our community, to take care of that victim, and actually, you know, to decrease recidivism, to help that juvenile develop um, that resiliency that we know that they need. So as we said, the good and bad news is your adolescent brain is going to be susceptible to positive influences and negative influences. We've all had that situation. Um, and it's susceptible to the toxic experiences, especially um, when we look at ACEs and the young, young children and how that toxic stress can inhibit and limit their ability to develop those synapses that fire and get that brain working so that we can work from down up and inside out to develop that brain. But because of the developing brain, this is an incredible time of opportunity and vulnerability. These youth can actually become responsible adults. When you look at the rate of recidivism in your county or, or your jurisdiction, I'm sure you'll see that the vast majority of our kids become successful adults. They, they really develop and continue to improve, but they need our intervention. Um, the, these behaviors, as Susan was saying, the behavior is not fixed. At this point, they are most open to rehabilitation and treatment. Susan, anything else you want to say in closing? Thank you. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for this excellent presentation. And, you know, really what comes back to me is that so much of this is, you know, things we did not learn any of this in law school, at least I didn't. Um, but it real, really shows the incredible role that a juvenile court prosecutor has yep. in um, helping to turn a life around. And yep. I, all of you who are out there um, participating today, I, I just, I applaud the work you're doing because I know that, um, you know, sometimes you may feel like a social worker or you have to learn all these things that, you know what, if you were in adult court, you don't have to get into all this. It's, it's usually much more set. But, but the good news is that all of this research um, helps us better um, to be better prosecutors. And I think especially, to me, juvenile court is the court of opportunity. This is the court where we really truly can not only turn um, a youth life around, but really um, increase public safety um, and even change within the families. So um, mm -hmm. I did want to note that we, what we've been doing at NDAA is creating a network for prosecutors. And any of you who are interested in being part of that network, um, it is limited to juvenile court prosecutors. And, but we do send out um, periodic updates on the research and promising innovative practices. Um, we also have updated, there's a resource called the Prosecutor's Encyclopedia. Again, that's a resource only available to juvenile court prosecutors, but 
um, you can email. I'm going to actually put my email address in here um, so that if any of you are interested in joining our um, network, please do so. And I'm trying to type and talk at the same time. <laughs> um, but really, thank you so much. And I, I mean, we had over 400 people on this webinar. So again, um, there's a silver lining to COVID. We were able to bring this presentation to many more people um, that we, than we would have been able to do in a regional training. And we will continue um, to do more trainings. And I'm happy to announce that next month's training is actually going to be really um, something that is very timely. And it's going to be about building bridges um, and building relationships between police and the communities that they work in. Because we know very often um, when those relationships aren't strong and when there's a disconnect between the police and the youth, um, that can lead to more crime. So um, we're looking forward to that presentation as well. And you'll be getting an update. That will be on August 5th. Um, and I think we're actually at 2.30. So um, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Um, the presentation is recorded. I know William has shared the um, uh, link to the recorded session. And um, oh, I'm getting the time out. So I've 11 seconds left. So thank you all for joining. Thanks, thank you for everything you're doing on the front lines. Um, yes, thank you all. I really appreciate it. Thanks for letting me be here. Life. Thank you so much, Stacey. Thank you. All right, thank you all for uh, joining today. Before we do adjourn, just a couple of brief an announcements from INTAC. Please note that you can uh, reach out to INTAC on the information listed on this slide. Um, also note that if you'd like to get in contact with the OJJDP TTA Help Desk, you may do so through the contact information on this slide. Do you have a training and technical assistance need? Well, if so, please be sure to reach out to via the OJJDP TTA 360 platform. Uh, it can be accessed through the link on this slide. Uh, also, remember that we do have our webinars, including this one, that will be posted on our INTAC YouTube page. For any type of supporting materials, you can reach out to OJJDP TTA at USDOJ.gov to receive uh, supporting materials related to any of our webinars that we have there. Uh, and again, we do have, uh, would like for you all to take a moment to uh, do a online evaluation. Uh, you can click here now to access the online evaluation. Uh, but if not, no worries. We will send out the evaluation to everyone on here uh, to give you a couple of minutes to just take about five minutes to provide feedback for today's presentation. Uh, again, please uh, join us um, for the upcoming um, webinar that we have. Um, excuse me, this is actually with, uh, we've changed this. So um, we'll send some updated information on that. But uh, this is correct here. We have some upcoming webinars with the Innocent Justice Foundation and with uh, APA coming up. These webinars are live and available for you all to access and um, to register for them. And finally, for those uh, remaining, if you could, please take a few minutes to uh, let us know, how do you plan to apply the information from this webinar to your work? Please note that this is multiple select, meaning that you can select more than one answer here. But we just want to get a good idea of how individuals plan on applying the information from this work, uh, from, from this webinar to your specific work that you do. Uh, again, multiple select, uh, feel free to choose multiple answers here. Again, uh, on behalf of all the presenters and uh, OJJDP's Intact, we thank you all for coming out today. Have a wonderful day.